Hi everyone, my name is Rachel Davis Small, and I'd like to welcome you to my lecture entitled, Who's to Blame When Disaster Strikes? Women as Scapegoats for Catastrophe in Early Modern Germany. In the wake of disaster, both learned and popular schools of thought attempted to answer unknowable questions. Why did this catastrophe strike us? How did such a crisis happen here? A common answer to these desperate queries was that magic was involved. A weather witch had most certainly conjured the disaster. Inquisition and secular courts across Germany and the rest of Europe charged many women with diabolical interference in the weather, causing terrible storms that destroyed buildings, bringing plagues on livestock, and hailstorms that ruined crops and harvests, along with other such things. This woodcut by Ulrich Molitor from the late 15th century uh, book on sorcery and witchcraft depicts a common Western image of weather witches. We see two um, elderly women adding ingredients to a boiling cauldron, standing beneath uh, the storm clouds and hail showers, which the women themselves had just conjured. Yet in my own research on disasters that occurred in Northern Germany from the mid 16th to the mid 18th century, I found that there's another different story uh, going on here. One that didn't involve uh, the blame of witchcraft and magic. I found many court cases, civic ordinances and sermons in which the authors of such documents used uh, very specific women from their local communities as scapegoats in order to explain the cause of a recent disaster and as a person to punish for the losses incurred during a catastrophic event. The use of a scapegoat typically function to relieve the outpouring of anxiety, fear, and anger that came in the wake of such atrocities. The scapegoat was the answer to that unanswerable question, why did this catastrophe strike us? In the early modern period, both Catholic and Protestant popular theological and Judicial thought portrayed women as uh, either the good wife, um, the good and faithful virgin, the dutiful and domesticated mother, or the rebellious and independent woman who brought shame on herself, on her family, and her local community. My doctoral research has focused so far on uh, cases of disasters that occurred in predominantly Protestant territories of Northern Germany. And I found that in those areas, the popular and elite opinions targeted the independent woman as a scapegoat for disaster. During the remainder of this lecture then, um, I wanna first look at how women's religious identity factored into their becoming a scapegoat. And then I'll discuss how women who had supposedly failed in their duties as wife and mother uh, caused God's wrath and brought disaster. Uh, lastly, we'll then look at uh, the domestic servants and peasant women who were allegedly neglectful and careless of their jobs and were then labeled as arsonists. One remarkable court case between a Catholic convent and the local town council of Grossenhain in the Duchy of Saxony offers us an example of independent women being blamed for a city fire. The women in question were Catholic nuns living uh, in a converted Protestant town in 1540. 
their religion and their refusal to leave the convent and to get married uh, caused great contention between the, ton the nuns and the town inhabitants, as well as with the municipal and ecclesiastical courts of Rosenheim. When a horrific fire spread through the city, destroying homes, public buildings, and churches, the nuns became an easy target for blame. Unfortunately for the women of the convent, the fire did begin in their walled garden, but yet the courts could never prove that the nuns had willfully committed arson by starting the fire behind their convent walls and then helping it uh, spread into the city to cause damage. Regardless of such a lack of evidence to support a case against the nuns, the municipal court sentenced the women to exile. The nuns had to flee from the town and find shelter in an unwelcoming landscape full of dangers to single independent women. What this case reveals to us is that one, uh, women who did not share or uphold their local community's religious beliefs were even more at risk of being targeted as scapegoats for disaster. And two, that in this particular instance, the nuns who lived outside of the prescribed Protestant ideals of motherhood and marriage were central targets for the blame. I'd like to take a moment to look at the second point about religion a little further here. Uh, the early modern period was a time of fundamental religious change, which caused an upswelling of anxiety over practices of faith. This led to a general sense that judgment day was near and that God would send his wrath down upon any community that was not adhering to his laws or the righteous laws of the state. Thus, Protestant communities who specifically had glorified marriage over celibacy and over sex outside of marriage sought to punish those who failed to follow such marital ideals. Sinners had to repent, pray, and cleanse themselves of all so-called impurities to keep God from bringing his punishments to the entire community um, through sending plague, fire, flood, and other disasters. With the fears of apocalypse and God's wrath in the forefront of popular and learned cultures, it becomes clear why the Catholic nuns were targeted as arsonists and then driven out of town. The local Protestant inhabitants feared God's punishment for tolerating and harboring the Catholic nuns, and thus the fire was interpreted as a divine sign of God's anger and his wish for the people of Grossenheim to cleanse the city of its sins by ousting the nuns and blaming them of arson. In the aftermath of disaster, the local clergy perform sermons and prayers that address the loss, suffering, and fear that the survivors in their parish experienced. In these sermons, we find that it was not only the Catholic nun who became a scapegoat for disaster, but the unruly Protestant woman as well. Let's take a quick look at uh, how an entire city came to blame one woman's private actions for a city fire. In the heat of the summer of 1558, a great thunderstorm surged over the city of Schwerin. A thunderbolt struck a tree in a burger's garden, sparking flames. Then wind picked up those flames carried them through the neighboring buildings and eventually burned down a large portion of the city. The survivors immediately sought someone to blame for this disaster. Popular belief suggested that the thunderstorm was a direct sign of God's involvement in the fire and that he must have been targeting a specific sinner in their community. 
This engraving depicts God casting thunderbolts down to a city and sparking a massive conflagration. The artist conveys the message that God physically caused the fires via storms, but God only would do so in response to the sins of the people in the city of which he was targeting. A sermon by Schwerin superintendent Heinrich Bilderbecken presented his parishioners with the evidence they needed to identify the person who allegedly brought God's wrath and destruction to their city. Bilderbecken claimed that this was all due to a singular unfaithful wife. Indeed, the lightning bolt had struck at the very house, quote, where the wife had been accused of undeniable public adultery, end quote. That very same day, the allegedly unfaithful wife had been tried in court by her own father and husband for adultery. Ultimately, the municipal court acquitted her of the crime of fornication and adultery. But in the wake of the fire, the councilman declared that the thunder and lightning must have struck her home because she was actually guilty of the crime and their decision had been wrong. This Protestant woman had been caught between the crossfires of rigid social standards for women and a city on the edge of collapse, seeking a scapegoat to blame for their troubles. The court's earlier ruling of her innocence could not even protect her from the survivor's rage and fear. They sought an answer to why such a devastating, inexplicable event happened in their city and to their loved ones. And this woman quickly became the solution to such an unanswerable question. Given the importance of women's roles as wives and mothers, Protestant theology and popular belief targeted women who failed to uphold their these primary functions in society. So let's now look at the depiction of women who um, had failed to protect their children from surging floodwaters and how those women then became scapegoats for that disaster. A horrific and infamous flood occurred in May 1613 throughout the region of Thuringia. It caused untold amounts of damage and many, many lives were lost. And one of the printed reports that came out documenting the tragedy and uh, seeking to help readers make sense of their losses, the author relates the 1613 flood to ancient historical and biblical tales of disaster. The author referenced the horrible weather Cassius Dio documented in his volumes on ancient Roman history and uh, how faithful wives and mothers had sought to save their children from imminent death. Dio wrote about the most spectacular of mothers who was found dead beneath the rubble of her home with her infant child alive still clinging to her breasts while she lay dead. The story of the protective mother appears in many early modern flood chronicles, but so too does the story of mothers who failed to save their children. For example, on the 25th of May, 1613, when the days long flood ripped through the Turingian vill village of Fiddlehausen, a young girl of four is reported to have drowned. The author of the report blamed her absentee mother who was a widow and was working in a mill near her home at the time that the floodwaters arrived. But since the mother had neglectfully left her three children at home, she was not able to save them. Her daughter, allegedly fell from her bed into the rising waters and drowned, and was eventually found lifeless in the family's barn. The author of this report argued that if it wasn't for the carelessness of this widowed mother, 
maybe no one in her small village would have perished at all. The engraving that accompanies this report on the 1613 Turingian flood illustrates the artists and commissioners vision of the disaster. Men have climbed up high in, uh, in many trees to save themselves, while one in particular in the background is sitting atop a building in prayer. We can also see in the foreground many livestock and people floating in the torrents. Uh, some appear to have uh, already drowned, while others are struggling to survive as they await rescue. And in the center of the engraving, the artist depicted a small child floating on top of the water in its crib. While we cannot tell if the child is dead or alive from this image, the audience still gets the sense that this helpless child has been abandoned by its mother and has an uncertain fate. Thus, again, showing how these schools of thought blamed uh, the neglectful uh, mother. Even when no lives were lost, the reality of disasters provided many understandable reasons for survivors panic, if not their association of blaming women for all of their losses. In a sermon following a fire on January 26, 1606 in Zuttelstedt, the parish pastor Valerian Tibanum summarized the town's anxiety and fears in the wake of this disaster. The city council faced the hardships of rebuilding the church, the school, and other communal buildings, which were foundational in uh, the parish's spiritual and financial economies, but they lacked the funds to reconstruct all of the major public facilities. Knowing this, the survivors of the fire feared that they would not personally receive relief aid to fix their own homes and businesses if all of the available funding was going to the reconstruction of these public buildings. The survivors undoubtedly questioned how they would continue to provide food and shelter for their families, how they would be able to continue their work to earn a wage to pay rent and taxes. This growing anxiety required a release valve. The pastor channeled his parishioners rage and fear toward the so-called frivolous vices of women which he alleged brought the wrath of God to Zuttelstedt. He asserted that if the good Protestants of the town wanted to avoid future conflagrations, they would need to control the local women's tendencies toward frivolity by enforcing a strict observation of the Sabbath, solely attending church and withholding from daily chores once a week. He wrote that women should not be occupied with their usual tasks of, quote, churning butter, cutting, and or knotting hay, and drying flax, and other such raggedy things that the women claimed they didn't want to do, but they couldn't wait to do during the rest of the week, end quote. The pastor suggested to his audience that women's inability to schedule their chores properly whether from laziness or bad time management, were so great that God struck their city with disaster and his divine rage. The trope of the neglectful woman, particularly of um, a domestic servant in a burger's home, appears time and time again across court cases and chronicles throughout the region in this time period. Oftentimes, a female servant is blamed for neglecting her watch over a fire that was burning in the oven or out in the uh, open behind the home, and thus she allowed the flames to spread throughout the city. In many cases, it was certainly the case uh, that this occurred, 
especially as female servants and peasant women primarily worked with highly flammable materials, not that they were especially neglectful. They worked with flax seeds, which were a central part of the early modern diet and were also used for things like sealants on woods. But the flax had to first be dried over a fire in order to render um, it edible and usable, putting women in this great position of, uh, of danger to cause fires. The illustration of two women working with dried flax here um, shows them by a river, and it's a common scene of these female peasants or domestic servants at work with such dangerous materials. So when um, women were not drying flax, they would also exclusively tend to the baking if the burger who employed them had an oven within his home. Um, and this oven typically caught fire from faulty ventilation, uh, leading to officials blaming women for such events. So when city fires began in a household, women were immediately a prime suspect for arson. The massive conflagration of 1612 in Nordhausen in northern Thuringia allegedly began in the home of the burger David Spicer. In the testimony from court cases and counter court cases that followed between the city and Spicer, his domestic maid servant was featured as the city's chosen, chosen scapegoat. Spicer himself had fled the scene and left town when the fire began, suggesting that he have he may have been the actual arsonist. Uh, however, Spicer readily told the courts at first that it was his neglectful and careless maid who had left apples baking in the oven unattended. This to the courts was a reasonable answer and they ended up pursuing the arrest of Spicer and his maid for arson. As the head of household, Spicer himself was legally responsible for the actions of his wife, children, and servants. And since it was unclear still who had technically started the fire in question, um, given that the neighbor had um, witnessed something entirely different, um, the courts still desired to question and then potentially charge uh, Spicer and the maid over the incident. However, as more evidence continued to come forward and Spicer suspiciously, suspiciously began changing his story of how the fire had begun, now targeting his neighbor, uh, the court became suspicious of the maid's role, uh, but did not change their accusations. Until 50 years later, um, after David Spicer and his maid were deceased, uh, the court decided that neither David nor the maid uh, were to blame. This alleviated the pressure of blame and social stigma that the Spicer descendants carried, but it had already done permanent damage to the maid. Her occupation and low social station as a single poor woman made her an easy target uh, as a scapegoat for the courts and for her employer, David Spicer. It was indeed women's social position in early modern Germany that made them prime targets for becoming scapegoats when unthinkable disasters happened. While too many women had to suffer the tortures of witchcraft accusations, Many women also bore the brunt of the social shame, exile, and loss of their independence in the wake of tragedy. The women who didn't suffer the blame of causing a disaster often found themselves widowed, caring for their children alone and houseless. You can see such women here in this broadsheet from a city fire in 1631 who are holding their young watching their homes turn to ashes 
and are likely imagining the dangerous situation ahead. My research is just now bringing to light how women in particular were impacted by catastrophes, but also how women came to be scapegoats for such disasters throughout Northern Protestant Germany. It was primarily those women who did not fit the ideals of the Protestant female character who were blamed. Those who were unmarried, celibate, allegedly unfaithful to their husbands or neglectful of their children and their occupational tasks, who found themselves at the center of social strife and ended up uh, as scapegoats for natural disasters. Thank you.